What do you think about that? That's a pretty nice setup. Got the light on me. Got the current in the background. Took the yellow jacket off. Take my jacket off. Um, yeah, hey guys. Another quarantine vlog. John Grimsmo here. Um, getting ready to film with Titan in about 20 minutes. Getting my area all cleaned up. Been here for a couple hours. Just cleaning and tidying and getting stuff ready. Um, now I gotta go around the shop. I don't know if you can hear the heater. It's like mm, humming. Turn that off. Make sure the air compressor doesn't come on, so I'll turn that off. Um, actually, I wonder if I wanna... I don't wanna block the current, actually. Look at that reflection right there. That's the light. Check this out. So I got Fraser's light. It might actually be too bright. I'm gonna turn it down a bit. It's a sweet light. Um, okay, what are we gonna do? I thought about turning the current on so that the lights are on on the inside. I might try that, although I don't know how it's going to complain without air. Um, anyway, yeah, prepping. I'm kind of, there's the air compressor. Um, I'm kind of nervous and I'm excited and I can't tell which is more. Like I'm really excited. Um, I'm probably making this a much bigger deal in my head than it is, but I mean, Titan's an awesome guy. I've been friends with him for a couple years. He's, for those of you who don't know, he's, he's a powerhouse in the manufacturing industry. He's like Mr. Manufacturing, um, going around doing all kinds of speeches, inspiring the youngsters, um, young people and old people, to get into manufacturing and to embrace the culture that we have. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and he's also training and educating anybody who wants it for free to learn Fusion 360 and manufacturing and CAD CAM and all that stuff. So a lot of respect for him and I'm honored to be on the show. So let's get ready. Don't you dare put the running scene in. <laughs> advice would you give someone who was planning to start from scratch with a similar budget machines tooling and begin? It's similar to Stein. Stein was like, basically, would you do the same thing that you did? Gil's asking, hey, do you have advice that uh, for somebody who basically has the same type of money that you had? and um the same a similar budget right and machines and stuff it, again it depends it always depends um i went into it like i still think i thought then and i still think to this day i could never be a job shop because i take forever to do everything that's why it's so perfect for me to have my own product because i can devote hundreds of hours into a screw or whatever um and then it eventually pays off. So it, the difference becomes if you're planning on being a job shop and you're developing your skills in order to take on work, uh, you can usually take on work you know, in a lot of different ways, whether it's high end or low end or whatever, just entry level stuff. But if you're creating your own product, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, is the product good? Is, are, is there a customer base? Are you gonna be able to sell it? Um, do you have the skills to sell it? Do you need to have somebody else on the team to be able to market and sell that thing? Uh, we're always in love with our own ideas and you know just because you came up with the new coolest thing doesn't mean anybody's going to care until you make them care i mean we've all seen stupid things get sold massively um and you're like how's that even a thing but i still want one <laughs> but there's i don't know there's a lot of different ways to do it but it, watch your money for sure um it's mostly about skill whether it comes to manufacturing or business or whatever so learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, there's no excuse now, no excuse to not know something. <laughs> yeah. You know, it takes time. You got to learn. But if you're willing to learn and put in the time, you can learn absolutely anything. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think that um, it is, it is, it's, your, what is your workload? What is your customer load? If you do not have dedicated customers and, and a relationship, like as an owner, you build a rapport you build, uh, your customer becomes like family with you. And if you don't have that, 
then you have to be cautious because it, it comes over time. You know what I mean? So if you don't have customers in place that can give you long-term contracts, then it is important that you start off in a way that allows you to pay those bills, even if you have no work. And yeah. only go beyond your means if you have a signed contract that goes out for six months or a year and you have faith in your product. Otherwise, you can run into big problems, and uh, you make the wrong step in this in this industry. I mean, it's a hard one. You so, talked about the ingredients, okay? I'm not here to like give out all my my secrets and <laughs> everything, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand. Like when you look at social media, and you look at YouTube, you look at you know the different platforms. It's not huge billion dollar companies that are like crushing, <laughs> having all the followers and yeah. stuff, right? Because it's not about money. It's, no. You can have the nicest cameras, you can have the nicest setup, you can have the nicest of everything, but it, it, it takes years. It takes years of developing the respect and getting past all the naysayers and, and putting yourself out there like you did. So I would say that one of what I see as one of your big successes is exactly what you just said, putting yourself out there, knowing that you're not the best. But you just keep trying and keep and people can actually take a journey with you yeah. and be like, hey, what's John doing uh, on Tuesday? What's John doing? I wonder how that knife came out that he was working on. And you become a fixture in their lives and you actually speak to them and answer their questions. And therefore, there's a relationship that builds. Like, it's crazy. I go around the world and I meet people and I know them. I'm like, dude, I was talking to you yesterday and I was like in you know, the US, you know, or I was talking to you this and, and we know each other, but at the same time, it's not about just selling a product. It's about relationships through yeah. social media. So I think that's a huge thing for people. Like don't expect to become huge overnight or even in a year or two. Oh, it no. takes time. And you don't need to. What's that? hundred dedicated followers can do amazing things for your business because they know people and they know people exactly. and all of a sudden you get a contract from a big company or whatever. Um, the, it's hard, the first hundred is the hardest too. Yeah. Right? So I'll tell you, um, when I first started doing YouTube videos, when I was building my first CNC machine, I had the camera forward and I would just show my hands because I was super camera shy and super nervous. And But I, I'd watch these videos from other people about how they built their machines. So I was like, well, I'm going to do a video on my machine and even through my car years before that i'd like to document the process so i just have these you know hands in front of the camera and i make stuff um and i had 50 subscribers on youtube i remember clearly i had 50 and most of them were like my friends or car buddies or family or whatever and then i clearly remember one day i was like fine let's just turn the camera around so i turned the camera around. i was like hey guys this is this is weird just looking at a camera but uh, i'm john and this is what we're going to do today and then slowly, but I just kept doing that. And then it got to 100 followers. It was like, whoa. It, like, it went from 50 like this to then it just, that was the moment when I turned the camera on myself and I became a personality. Just just somebody that somebody could relate to and like be friends with. You know, like you just become somebody's, I, I don't know, you connect. You make this connection, this emotional connection with the viewer when you're looking straight at them in the camera and you speak to them, not to nothing. Um, it made a huge difference. And then you get to 50, and then you get to like 500 subscribers, and then you get to 800. I remember 800 was a big one, because we're like, whoa, this has been not very long time. And I mean, even now, 10, 10 years later, we're at 67,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is amazing, but it's nothing like millions, whatever. I don't care, because I have such a core group of fans and customers and followers and industry professionals that I'm like, I got everything I need. This is great. Awesome. That's awesome. How's it going guys? Fraser here. Uh, that was just a little bit of clips that you saw from the live stream that Titan and John did on Monday. Um, so if you want to see the full thing, we're going to be linking the entire thing in the description. So thank you again for Titan and everyone over there at Titans at CNC for making this happen. Uh, they obviously had a lot of fun. There's a lot of really good knowledge in there. Uh, and we highly recommend that you go check it out. So again, it's linked in the description. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the vlog. Oh, it was an hour and a half. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm like sweating. Um, that was good. That was, I'm kind of somewhat dis disappointed because I couldn't get the camera, the nice camera, um, hooked up to the Skype. 
through the Canon EOS app or whatever. I think because I'm on the Chrome version of Skype, not the desktop app version, and I, I didn't test it beforehand, so I didn't have enough time really. But anyway, that was awesome. Uh, super good chat with with Titan. Uh, went deep about all kinds of stuff. I got to talk about a lot. I got to ask him super good questions and, and have him go deep on a lot of stuff. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of stuff that I'm going to have to crunch on. I'm going to have to think about for a while. Whether it's documenting processes throughout the shop or, or how he hires and trains guys or how he teaches in education. Uh, it was really, really good. Really good. I got a lot to think about. And that's what I do. I think. I think and I think and I think and I think. And I love that I think. But sometimes I think too much. I think I think too much. Um, but, but yeah, Titan, Titan is an amazing guy. And uh, a lot of respect for him. Just kind of makes me, I don't know, I'm always thinking about where I want to take this industry, where I want to take this business, the team, um, how to grow it, how to grow more, more team members, how to train everybody on more stuff. Um, how to keep going. I'm never, I'm, I'm happy right now, but I know there's always so much more and it's like just out of reach and it's always just out of reach, but you level up and you level up and you level up and you don't remember where you are. And then you gotta like, you gotta take a deep breath and you gotta look back and you be like, holy crap, I'm really high up the mountain right now. Like, yeah, the peak is still way up there, but, and I'll never reach it. And that's okay. But like, I'm in the clouds, like it's really high up the mountain already. And uh, you just keep leveling up, I don't know. It was a great conversation. Check it out on Facebook. Uh, I don't do Facebook, but apparently the whole video, hour and a half video is gonna be up. He's gonna splice it up. He's gonna put it on Instagram, YouTube, things like that. Um, I'll probably get a couple clips and I'll splice them in. And uh, I gotta pee. <laughs> All right, time for some food. Let's turn this light off. Uh, I don't know if I've shown you guys the uh, kitchen area in our shop. So we have the big shop space back here, like three or 4,000 square feet, I forget exactly. All the fun toys, got the bay door, the front door, and then these two doors go into the office area. So in here we got shipping, it's dark. Shipping room back there with uh, boxes and stuff. Got a bathroom right there where we wash our hands and go to the bathroom. Uh, a door here that we don't use, we just leave it open all the time. I'm in a hallway right now with some epic windows. And then another front door there and then stairs that go upstairs here. Stairs, all the lights are off. And then this right here is our kitchen area. If you remember from our last shop, the kitchen was a tiny room like a quarter, a fifth the size, maybe a quarter the size of this room, um, which was also Aaron's office, or then Fraser's office, the uh, the media department. So it was like kitchen, fridge, coffee maker, a burner plate, toaster, um, counter, and a media office. So yeah, so here we got the fridge in the back, got a little counter right there, a little round table, a little prep station right here, microwave, coffee maker, garbage, um, server room right there. Not that we're really running servers, but that's what they did. Um, but yeah, now we have a place, not, not so much during quarantine or, you know, social distancing and stuff. We're gonna, once we get back to it, we're gonna have to tweak things up a little bit. But before that, it was really, really nice to have a place. We could have six chairs around the table. We'd have our meetings in here. Um, to have a place that was quiet, that was outside the shop, and we could, you know, be together and chill. Um, the window right there. It's, I love this shop. It's, it's awesome. The funny thing is, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how this happened. Nobody knows how this happened. But uh, this is a little kit I got off of Amazon. Lock picking kit. Because that room is a bathroom. But it's locked. And the key is inside. I clearly remember the key is on the, the sink in there. And you, you lock it when you're in the bathroom using it and then you leave. But I, somebody must have locked the door and closed it. Um, and nobody remembers who. But it's been locked for a couple days. So I gotta fiddle around with the lock picking set. Maybe I'll do that today. What I really need right now is some food. I'm drained. That was good. So 
brag a little bit about what we do here. Um, I like to have food available for the team. So we got a fridge. We usually keep it stocked. Barry does Costco runs. Uh, you know, you got your deli meats, you got your some salads, so whatever the guys want, really. Um, for the most part, I would like to be able to provide food if they want it. We make burritos every day. Um, I got bananas and, and apples and chips and salsa and uh, cookies every now and then. Like, I, I want to be able to provide food for the guys, so we do. And it's awesome. And I don't mind incurring that expense. I like the guys being taken care of. Um, some guys still go out for lunch. Some guys bring in food. Um, some guys eat here all the time. And uh, it's a good mix. I like it. And we're still small enough that I don't mind buying food for everybody. You know, if we had like 50 people, that's, you need your own chef to do that. But, uh, but yeah, it's cool. I like it. So hungry. I even brought lettuce from home so I can put it in my burrito. Fun fact, peppers are my absolute favorite vegetable. Didn't always used to be, but I can't get enough of them now. Totally my favorite. Um, also fun fact, <clears throat> this is a Cutco knife. Cutco's a uh, culinary company, they make kitchen knives, and uh, they got a weird, well, unique sales model where they typically hire high school students or young people in their 20s or whatever and it's it's door-to-door -door sales and it has been for whatever 50 years it's neat because it trains it it trains salespeople to, to sell knives which is neat um when eric was in his like 18 to 20s he uh he worked for cutco so we got a lot of sweet cutco knives now and it's neat that you know he's 31 ish now um it's neat that now we're super in the knife industry, and even before that, he was in the knife industry. You know what I mean? It was kind of a cool, circuitous thing. Like, he's always done it. I've had a knife in my pocket since I was 11 years old. I'm 36 now. And uh, some things about your life, you just, you don't realize what's actually happening until it makes sense later. So that's cool. Mm. I was just thinking, I never addressed why there's a bathroom in our kitchen. Um, this used to be an office, obviously. And having like a main office with your own bathroom would be sick. And that's what they had in the previous tenants. Um, this just happened to be the most central, like biggest, best meeting area lunch room for us. Planning out the layout of the building. And it just happens to have a bathroom on board. I don't even think about these anymore. But it's funny. I was at the store and I was like, oh, we need plates. Yes, those ones. <laughs> All right, belly is full. Uh, I'm going to try to pick that lock for a few minutes. If I can't get it, I'll move on. Uh, last thing I just wanted to mention is you can see we roughed in the plumbing there to put a sink in like a little bench unit, whatever, kitchen and counter. I don't know, kitchens. Counter, sink, do our dishes, wash our hands, everything in, in this room. I think it'll be epic. It's going to encroach on our little uh, room for the table, but it needs to happen. All right, I give up. 10 or 15 minutes of that and I, I get like, I think there's five pins, I get like four out of five pins and I just can't get that last one. Uh, let's go make some rask blades. So while I was cleaning up my workspace here, uh, almost done, I unpacked this box and it turns out it's my, it's my prototype box for when we started creating the Saga pen. <clears throat> so I've got some, some big chunker springs from McMaster that are obviously uh, way too big. But they're not the tip spring, they're the return spring for the slider up there. So this guy is spring-loaded. 
and I needed a little spring so I thought I would buy these and cut them down but uh, obviously not because we found a better solution so I got to store these somewhere where springs are so that when I need springs I can find them but these are the springs we ended up going with there's they're wave springs by uh, Smalley and they're super cool So these ones have uh, closed ends, which means the top is flat, as opposed to these ones where it's not closed, so the top is still wavy. And it's made of a continuous strand of, of coil. So the coil goes around and up and down and around and up and down and um, makes for a really cool spring. And allows the compressed stack height to be almost nothing. I think I measured these at like 56 thou compressed, 200 thou extended, or 190 thou extended. So they work awesome. Now, this is the L2 size, this is the L1 size. I don't need the L1s, so I need to make sure that they get separated and we don't ever look at them wrong. And then I can take, it turns out I have 160 plus, no, 160 are good with the shim. And then these 54 have no shim, so I don't want to use those, but I have another project for those. But these 160 can go into our inventory, get added to the inventory. They've just been sitting in a box here, along with all these inserts, these inks, um, that have just been sitting here too. So uh, make sure they're still good, but they can definitely go back into inventory. I don't think I've seen this table clear since I moved in. All right, let's see how clean we can keep it for a while. It is human nature to put stuff on a surface. Okie dokie. So, what I gotta do now is I gotta inspect the two blades I made two days ago. I'm gonna mount up a new one, and then uh, I gotta figure out what little tiny tweaks I wanna make to the next one uh, to get ever so slightly closer to a, a good recipe. Oh, and I gotta change the serial number. It's annoying now because I gotta manually count up every time. I gotta change the code and then post whatever, but for now I'm gonna keep going one, two, three, and, and hopefully I don't make a duplicate. Um, I don't think the final engraving is gonna be on the spine here, although it looks really sick. I'll consider it. Normally I put it right here, but uh, yeah, because, well, this one's ancient, but you can kind of barely see it right in there. Normally it's nice to be able to see the serial number or whatever when it's just sitting there. Um, here could be, I don't know, I gotta think about it. But yeah, let me take a close look at these and figure out what I did wrong. So one of the things I've been playing with is um, putting a micro chamfer on the outside perimeter from about here, this way, to right about where the bevels are going to uh, you know, go. Keep in mind, this is ancient. This is like the first one I ever made, so the bevels look gross. But it's the only one I have close to me right now. But yeah, a little micro bevel right there, like a chamfer, like a 45 degree, um, or in this case, a 60 degree, because I have a thread mill mounted up in the machine. And what I use the thread mill for is I thread mill the top of this hole, and then I plunge it down, and I thread mill the bottom. And then I do the same for the stop pin arc. I do the top and then I plunge it underneath and then I thread mill or I, I chamfer the bottom. Um, and I thought it would be a sweet idea to chamfer the profile with the same tool because I can go top and I can go bottom without having to reclamp or move the blade or anything. So I'd go like that and then I'd go down and I'd do it again. And I did it for both with a little tiny tweak in between each one. and. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to see it on the camera. Let's get the reflection just right here. So there you can see this front one is, is basically perfect. 
but the back one, undercut. Um, it's hard to tell, but imagine the tool basically goes like this, like centered on the blade, not, uh, not past it. So there's this little tiny little undercut right there. I can feel my, the tool is, is in it right now. It's sliding in that groove. Um, and I changed it by, I'll have to check, I forget, but like two thou or three thou or something. So there's not a lot of wiggle room there. And the problem with this method is it's very dependent on the thickness of the steel coming in. If, it, if that varies by a thou or so, which it can, um, that's gonna change it. And then it's also critical on the grind of the tool, the exact thickness from the tip, because I measure the tip with the laser probe, from the tip to the, the crest of that thread and how thick it all is. And it's just putting a lot of assumption that the tool is perfect and the material is perfect always and forever um, for such a like one thou or two thou chamfer. And uh, I just don't know if it's repeatable. Not the machine's problem, that's a tooling and a material problem. So I'm thinking about it, I don't know yet. It looks kind of cool. Um, it's certainly nice to have it deburred right off the machine. And not that it's a burr, but it's certainly a sharp, sharp edge. And the other cool thing is the rask, once it's assembled and down, um, it looks really cool. I'm upside down and backwards here too, so my angles are all wrong. It looks really cool having a square uh, spine. And it, especially here, it like hides, it, it, it's just flush. I kind of like it. So I, I definitely don't want a big, big bevel, but you can see even on this one, there's a shine there right on the edge. And that we've probably just scotch branded the corners and, and blended it down a little bit. But for being the very first blade, um, coming off the Tormac in our garage 2015 before we moved to the first shop. It flips decent. It flips, you know, I'm almost happy with that. It's got some lock stick. Um, it drops okay. Yeah, the lock stick's really annoying. Oh, I can see that lock face is weird. It's like angled in or it shouldn't be. But it's a sweet concept, man. It's a sweet prototype. What do we see? April 2015. Uh, can't we, what does it say, Rask? Rask prototype. You've got a little engraving right there on the inside. So I've got, uh, as I'm redesigning the Rask for the Kern, um, you know, we haven't made this knife in three, three and a half years. Um, I get to play with it, I get to change it, I get to try new things. I get to figure out what sort of tweaks, not only for manufacturing, but for design, I wanna make. Um, I haven't gotten so far as to think of like new patterns or new little features, but uh, I'm trying to think of the manufacturability of it right now. And any little tiny little thing I wanna add, like a sharpening choil, we added that right in there. So that's gonna be a welcome addition. Um, a lot of people love that on the Norseman. Does mine have one? No, this was, this was pre-sharpening choil, so there's no choil right there. This is number 1020 from, uh, I don't even know if there's a date on this one. It's a prototype. But yeah. What am I doing? Okay, make some tweaks, make blade. So here's one of the problems with the way I'm using the thread mill underneath the hole. See how that tip is right? So if this is the hole, the dark green is the hole and the light green is material, the tip is like right there, which leaves absolutely zero room for any up and down discrepancy. Um, what I need to do is I need to get that whole tool and I need to move it down so that the, the instead of the tip of the tool being here, it's more like this and there's still plenty of shank room there. So I can go quite a bit that way. That way the material's hitting here, not here. Hope that makes sense. These are the current settings that are getting me that. So I'm gonna draw a quick sketch at a 60 degree angle to figure out how much to move it without screwing up the relationship between those two.
Whoops, I accidentally recorded 48 minutes of screen capture. We don't need all of it. Um, you could probably cut it, well, wherever you want, but... Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna shoot one more quick scene at the end with this, and then it'll make sense. Sync check. Um, okay, so after quite a bit of math, let me show you my sketchy. So I drew my thread mill here, and then I basically uh, faked in a lower chamfer, and I faked an upper chamfer, and I added some dimensions and some linkages and some blah blah blahs, and I basically figure, okay, I want the chamfer to be about halfway up the tool, and. This was all theoretical until I go to here and I proved it. And I go that, 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 and that, and that. And then if I simulate those. And then we do a little side profile. You can see pivot looks good. It's even top to bottom. Um, little chamfer right there, little chamfer right there. That's for the stop pin slot, looking really good. And even the micro chamfer around the outside, looking really good and even. This might actually work. So let's test it out in the machine now. And see what we get. All right, so even after much, uh, uh, math and try to get those chamfers right. The bottom side is too heavy and the top side is basically non-existent. The chamfer on the top. So uh, that's progress which is good. So I need to make the bottom side less deep and the top side deeper and I can tweak. I've separated them into two different sets of tool paths now so it it should be pretty good. Going good. Bling, 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 bling. I've made five blades already. Eight and a half minute cycle. Pretty happy with that. A lot of details, getting there nice and slow. Um, they're getting there. They're really, really getting there. Yeah, man. Okay, that's good. I've been playing with the pivot hole diameter, just trying to get, I chamfer it, make sure the burrs don't go inside. I'm um, trying to get the diameter just perfect. This one's looser than I want, um, but I was playing with it. I was like exaggerating my movements. And uh, so now I know I gotta back that off a little bit. Good. All right, guys, I'm out. Later.